on the face of it, Locke is a powerful ally of the libertarian. First, he believes, as libertarians today maintain, that there are certain fundamental individual rights that are so important that no government, even a representative government, even a democratically elected government, can override them. Not only that, he believes that those fundamental rights include a natural right to life, liberty, and property. And furthermore, he argues that the right to property is not just the creation of government or of law. The right to property is a natural right in the sense that it is pre-political. It is a right that attaches to individuals as human beings, even before government comes on the scene, even before parliaments and legislatures enact laws to define rights and to enforce them. Locke says in order to think about what it means to have a natural right, we have to imagine the way things are before government, before law. And that's what Locke means by the state of nature. He says the state of nature is a state of liberty. Human beings are free and equal beings. There is no natural hierarchy. It's not the case that some people are born to be kings and others are born to be serfs. We are free and equal in the state of nature. And yet, he makes the point that there's a difference between a state of liberty and a state of license. And the reason is that even in the state of nature, there is a kind of law. It's not the kind of law that legislatures enact. It's a law of nature. And this law of nature constrains what we can do, even though we're free, even though we're in the state of nature. Well, what are the constraints? The only constraint given by the law of nature is that the rights we have, the natural rights we have, we can't give up, nor can we take them from somebody else. Under the law of nature, I'm not free to take somebody else's life or liberty or property, nor am I free to take my own life or liberty or property. Even though I'm free, I'm not free to violate the law of nature. I'm not free to take my own life or to sell myself into slavery or to give to somebody else arbitrary, absolute power over me. So where does this constraint, you may think it's a fairly minimal constraint, but where does it come from? Well, Locke tells us where it comes from, and he gives two answers. Here's the first answer. For men, being all the workmanship of one omnipotent and infinitely wise maker, namely God, they are his property, whose workmanship they are made to last during his, not one another's, pleasure. So one answer to the question is, why can't I give up my natural rights to life, liberty, and property is? Well, they're not, strictly speaking, yours. After all, you are the creature of God. God has a bigger property right in us, a prior property right. Now, you might say that's an unsatisfying, unconvincing answer, at least for those who don't believe in God. 
What did Locke have to say to them? Well, here's where Locke appeals to the idea of reason. And this is the idea that if we properly reflect on what it means to be free, we will be led to the conclusion that freedom can't just be a matter of doing whatever we want. I think this is what Locke means when he says, the state of nature has a law of nature to govern it which obliges everyone, and reason, which is that law, teaches mankind who will but consult it that all being equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions, 